Welcome, everybody. I have uh, started the recording here for this month's CIDR session. My name is Lynn Anderson, and I'll be moderating today's CIDR session. The sessions are sponsored by Athabasca University and, its, and the Center for Distance Education and Illuminate. All of the sessions are recorded and will be available at the CIDR site along with the PowerPoint presentation and you can access those recordings at the link I'm about to put into the text box. There you go. The, now um, before we begin I wanted to just have a little fun and see where everybody's coming from. So uh, I'll put up the map slide and uh, you can Show us where you are coming from on the map by clicking on the little wand to the left of Alaska and then clicking on the your position on the map. Looks like mostly North America. I'll give everyone a few moments. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter for today's session, uh, Michael Barber. Michael was a presenter for us uh, almost two years ago when he provided us with the 2008 report on the state of the nation and we're happy to have him back to keep us up to date on what's happening across Canada in K-12 distance education. For those of you who don't know Michael, he is an assistant professor at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan where he teaches instructional technology and qualitative research methodology. Michael is originally from Newfoundland and Labrador and his interest in distance education began there after accepting his first high school teaching position in a regional high school which was in a rural community of about 3,500 people. At the time Michael was bothered by the uh, inequity of opportunities provided to his rural students and so he began to offer a program himself for advanced placement in social studies courses over the internet to students at his own school and other schools in the district. Michael then decided to further his own education in the field and he completed his PhD in instructional technology at the University of Georgia. Michael, <coughs> sorry, Michael's current research interests focus on the effective design, delivery and support of online learning to K-12 students in virtual school environments, particularly those in rural jurisdictions. So uh, anyways, we're very happy to have you back, Michael, and, uh, and speaking with us again today on uh, what's happening across Canada. So I'll turn over the microphone and let you get started. Okay, thank you, uh, Lynn. I uh, appreciate that introduction. I know it was kind of a mishmash of two or three of the biographies that you've had access to, so um, I appreciate the time you took putting that together. Um, as Lynn mentioned, uh, I'm Michael Barber at Wayne State University, although I live in Windsor, Ontario, um, maintaining my, my Canadian nationalhood and pride and that kind of thing. Um, and it also explains a little bit why some guy who works at Detroit, uh, University of Detroit, is studying online learning in Canada. Um, but just to, to give you, a, I guess, a little bit of background um, where this comes, this is actually the third year that we've done this study. As Lynn mentioned, I was here uh, almost two years ago talking about the second year, which is the one with the blue cover. Um, as you can see, each year we've added a little bit to the cover in terms and both um, changed the color as well. Uh, the things that are added are actually the sponsors that we've had, and um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention them in a second. But just to give you a sense, the first one was a, we entitled a snapshot um, state of the nation because it was designed to just give a quick look at what was going on um, for each province and territory. We probably had a couple, three paragraphs about each. Uh, did a little bit more in-depth looking at Ontario, Newfoundland, and British Columbia only because I was originally from Newfoundland, so I had known what was going on there fairly um, 
firsthand. Uh, Tim Linkleman uh, did a great job in terms of providing information for me that first year uh, with the, the BC situation. And uh, at the time, I was also living in uh, Ontario and was becoming more and more familiar with what was happening here and had access to a number of key individuals. The 2009 report, the green one, was the first one where we did it in a more of a systematic way and actually had the opportunity to uh, look at e what was happening in each of the provinces. And then this year, we've continued that along with adding in a couple of features. I mentioned I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the, the people who sponsored uh, this report. Um, they provided essentially the financial backing that allowed for uh, the graduate research assistants that I hired to help me with uh, both the research and the preparation of this report. Um, interestingly enough, the two of the three of them are U.S focused uh, groups. Uh, Connections Academy and K-12 Inc. are two uh, cyber charter providers in the United States um, and obviously Desire to Learn is a learning management platform based in Ontario. And uh, so I thank them for their sponsorship and hope that they will continue to do so uh, as we continue to publish these reports. Just to give you a bit of the background. Um, in terms of how this came about, we've been looking at this now, like I say, for three years. And um, what we've been hoping to do actually is is to have the involvement of the, the ministries or departments of education across the country uh, to provide information for the reports. Uh, as you can see from the table there, um, MOEs would be your ministries of education. And as it stands right now, we've been able to um, at some point in history, been able to get uh, cooperation and information from the Ministry of Education uh, for every jurisdiction except for Ontario and Alberta. Um, and unfortunately, um, those two jurisdictions uh, have declined participation in both years, although we've been fortunate in that both in both provinces there have been a number of individuals that um, we label as key stakeholders or the KSs there uh, that have been able to provide information. In most cases, these are individuals that have been involved in the um, the practice of K-12 distance education for considerable amounts of time. In some cases, uh, people who are former ministry people, which has always been uh, quite useful. The other code that you'll see there is DA or document analysis. In a lot of cases, that's where we started in most of the provinces, simply doing an analysis of the documents that they had devoted to uh, distance education or distributed learning. Um, and even now, as we move forward, that still forms a big part of it, particularly as some jurisdictions are creating more in the way of actual regulation that you uh, see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit first about sort of a national picture, and then we'll move to each of the individual provinces, and then finish up with some broad themes, and, and then um, we should have some time for questions and discussion. If you look at sort of the national picture, there is some form of K-12 distance education, and I'll use the terms distance education, distributed learning, and uh, online learning interchangeably, even though I know that they're not synonyms. Um, the reason I'll use them interchangeably is because depending on what province you happen to be sitting in, they have a preferred term that they will use. For example, in Ontario, uh, the term that you see used most often, particularly from the, the ministry, is e-learning. Um, the division that's responsible for K-12 uh, distance education in the province is actually e-learn Ontario. Whereas if you go through most of the western provinces, they use the term distributed learning. If you go to Newfoundland, for example, they'll use the term online or web-based learning. Um, so I'll use all of those interchangeably, um, knowing that there are some nuances there that we could discuss afterwards. Um, and in most of the provinces, I'll try to point out the types of distance education that they're using. But as you can see from, from this map, everyone's doing something. Um, if you look at um, Newfoundland and New Brunswick, you'll see they have a, a single province-wide program. Uh, there are several provinces there from Nova Scotia going across to British Columbia that have some kind of provincial system but also have substantial 
uh, district-based programs. Um, you'll see that uh, Quebec, Alberta, and Manitoba primarily use district-based programs, and then the north along with Prince Edward Island. While they do have some internal programs, tend to get most of their, dis their K-12 distance education from other provinces. Um, when I'm talking about uh, these district-based or province-based, typically speaking, what I'm looking at there is who is responsible for the delivery of the program. I mentioned that because someone just sent me a, a message um, asking that question. So essentially, who is responsible for the delivery of the program? Looking ahead or moving ahead, a couple of national trends that, that you see. Um, this, the nature of this study actually, or the idea of this study came about from the keeping pace reports that John Watson produces every year in the U.S. Essentially they were designed to be a Canadian version. And one of the things that John keeps talking about every year is that the nature of regulation and the amount of online learning activity in the U.S. varies significantly from state to state. And the same can be said of, of Canada, particularly on the regulation front. Most jurisdictions have some kind of regulation. Just figuring out where it is and how it's managed is very significantly. And as we go through each of the individual provinces, you'll see, or provinces and territories, or you'll see that um, it changes a, a, a significant amount. If you look at just the total number of students enrolled in distance education, I would say right now that the largest single group is still taking distance education using print-based materials, the old correspondence model. I'm not saying that it's the majority, but if you were to divide up the different sort of delivery modalities, that is still the, the largest one right now. Um, another interesting trend that you see in Canada that you do not see south of the border, for that matter, in many other jurisdictions that uh, focus upon K-12 online learning is uh, a reliance upon synchronous instruction. There are a number of programs throughout Canada that uh, either have significant synchronous components or that are entirely synchronous, uh, which is something that, um, you know, someone who works at a U.S. institution, when I look across the 50 states, I don't see that. Um, if you're looking for quantifying this, uh, right now there's somewhere between 150 and 175,000 K-12 students that have taken at least one online course. That's not looking at enrollments, that's just looking at individual course or individual students. Um, and that represents somewhere between about 3 and 3.5% 3 of the total K-12 population uh, in the country. So looking at our sort of geographic look across the country, and I'll start in the east, being a native Newfoundlander. Um, in Newfoundland, they began with district-based programs starting in the mid-90s. That sort of morphed, and a lot of the proponents of, of those programs and people behind them um, were the ones who came together around 2001 to form a single province-wide virtual school, although they don't use the term virtual school, um, but that's essentially what it is. Uh, focus is primarily up on rural students, although you're starting to see uh, it seeping more and more into the urban and suburban areas as a way of, of solving scheduling conflicts and those types of things, um, although the, the largest single group of users still tend to be rural students who can't access the courses any other way. Um, Newfoundland is one of the few jurisdictions that has no policies whatsoever, even though they have the, a provincial program program that's housed in the ministry. You'll see as we go along that while there are other provinces that don't necessarily have policies, they tend not to be directly involved with the delivery of K-12 distance education. Uh, so that's a little bit of an anomaly there. Um, the annual enrollment in Newfoundland varies between about 1,500 to I think a high was 1,826 um, a couple of years back, and the last couple of years it's been in around the 1500-1600 range. Moving westward into Nova Scotia, um, their programs there began around 2003. Uh, right now they've got a couple of district-based virtual schools plus a province-wide, and I should have removed the word pilot because it's no longer a pilot program. Um, one of the, the interesting things about Nova Scotia 
is that it's the only jurisdiction where the main form of regulation for K-12 distance ed actually comes in the form of the collective agreement that the teachers union has with the government. There are 11 separate provisions in the collective agreement that focus specifically upon distance ed. And it's actually a fascinating um, a fascinating uh, document to, to look through because the, these provisions look at everything from making sure that teachers have equitable workloads and, and essentially equitable quality of life um, issues compared to uh, their face-to-face -face or, or brick-and-mortar counterparts, but there's also things in there that talk about how the distance ed program is going to be structured in terms of how it's going to be supported at the local level, who's responsible for different things. Um, there's provisions in there that specifically mandate um, professional development for those that are both teaching and supporting distance ed in the province, which is, is um, I think, actually rather forward-thinking in, in my personal opinion. Um, and then looking at, at sort of the amount of activity, uh, they tend to have about uh, 2,500 to 1,800 students there, although most of those students, I think it's a slightly higher than half, about 55% are involved with their correspondence offerings that they have. So not necessarily online learning, but still the, the old print-based materials. Um, looking at Prince Edward Island, they do have a small internal video conferencing program that gets used from time to time, although the majority of their online learning um, takes place from programs that they get from the province of New Brunswick. Uh, they've had two ministerial directives, one in 2001 and one in 2005, which um, have about five or six specific guidelines uh, about how distance education can be used. Um, but as you can see, it's a relatively small system. It was about 40 students last year. I think the year before it was um, somewhere in the low 30s. The year before that it was in the mid 20s. Um, so it's not something that, that I think is that prevalent there, which is probably why uh, the ministerial directives are, are enough in terms of how it gets regulated. Um, looking at the province of New Brunswick, uh, they were again another group of early adopters uh, around 1998. Uh, a single province-wide program, and one of the interesting things about this is that consistently, um, as we've been doing these reports, about a third of the enrollments that they have in their provincial course management system um, utilizing the course content aren't students that are at a distance. It's actually face-to-face -face teachers that are using the course content and the course management system in a blended fashion with their students, which I think is, is uh, fascinating. And as a researcher, if, if I had time to be able to, to go down to New Brunswick, it's something that, that I'd, I think really warrants additional study because uh, it's one of the, the few places that you see blended learning being used in such an extensive way. Um, well, they don't have any specific policies in terms of, uh, say, ministerial directives or things from the collective agreement or, or even um, specific um, ministerial guidelines. The provincial program is housed within the Ministry of Education, and in order to participate in the program, um, you have to meet all of the guidelines that they have in what they call, I can't remember if it's a distance ed or distributed learning handbook that comes out. And uh, I know last year's was something like 96 or 98 pages, so it's fairly detailed in terms of, of the types of criteria of things that you have to do, um, everything from the, the, the personnel that you have to put in place to support support the students that are engaged in their online or in their distance ed programs there um, to um, who's responsible for uh, everything from testing to proctoring to uh, submitting grades. It, it's a very, very extensive um, set of requirements that's in this handbook and, school, and districts have to follow it in order to participate. Um, interestingly, even though they have about the same population as um, Nova Scotia, you note that they have slightly fewer students that are involved. Uh, 
somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000. And actually, I think this year in the English side, it's down in the 1,300s, um, and between 350 and 750. And I think the 350 is this year in the French language program. I know talking with the folks down there, they've actually experienced a significant decrease this year in distance ed enrollments. Um, I'm not sure why that is, uh, and it's one of the few jurisdictions where we've seen that in Canada. But this particular year, it's the numbers are down um, somewhere to 60 to 70 percent of the level of what they were last year. Um, looking at uh, Quebec, our, our only French only province, um, back in I think it was the early 90s, uh, may have been the late 80s, the Ministry of Education there devolved the responsibility of distance ed to the individual school districts and because of that you don't see a systematic approach that's taking place in the province now. There are three jurisdictions, there are three organizations that are doing something when it comes to, to distance ed. Um, the largest and most comprehensive of those is uh, SOFED, which right now has about 45,000 enrollments. And if I remember correctly, they are working with some 50-odd um, school districts throughout the province. Um, they provide most of their distance education through uh, print-based materials and their system is set up that it's basically for adult learners. So it's almost like a distance ed GED kind of program uh, that they've got there. So if they remember correctly, the requirements are specifically that you have to be 16, you have to have dropped out of school at some point, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, Learn Quebec is, is another organization. This is an uh, anglophone organization within the province that provides a variety of services, one of which is they provide synchronous distance education um, to school districts. And in their synchronous distance ed program, they've got about 300 enrollments, mostly in rural areas. Uh, they also have things like a, an online tutoring service, which students can take advantage of. And um, they have literally thousands of multi uh, of learning objects that they've placed in a repository um, that they get some in the vicinity of three to four thousand um, logins on a monthly basis of students that are or students or teachers that are logging in to use these these online materials so the actual provision of distance education for Learn Quebec is just a, a small part of their overall mission. Although with the, the synchronous video conferencing that they do use, um, they're one of the few that have that synchronous only mission. Uh, one of the things I did forget to mention when I was talking about Newfoundland is uh, one of the um, interesting things about the delivery model that they use in Newfoundland is approximately, depending on the subject area, somewhere between 30 and 80 percent of the instruction is delivered synchronously um, using, it used to be Illuminate, I'm not sure if they're still using that uh, program now. Um, so similar to Learn Quebec, except for Learn Quebec uses 100% uh, uh, synchronous. The other group is the uh, Remote Network Schools Initiative, which if you look at their annual reports, um, or I guess their three-year reports that they've put out, in each of the ones they've had, they've always talked about moving into uh, distance education, <clears throat> but they haven't got to that point yet. Um, they're responsible, in all honesty, for connecting a lot of the rural schools throughout the province. Uh, they do a lot when it comes to distance teacher professional development. Um, they just haven't moved, in, and even for that matter, connecting individual classes together so that you could get a, a teacher teaching math in one uh, rural school, connect with, with another teacher teaching math in a second rural school, and to do some shared projects that way. But the actual act of distance education isn't something that they've gotten involved with yet. Looking to our most populous province, uh, online learning in the province began at the district level um, in 94 and in terms of the organization or structure of it, it's still for the most part um, done at the district level. So most of the programs throughout the province are district-based programs, but I think it's about four years ago now, around 06, um, possibly 05 the province decided that they were going to um, get more active in the game and um, essentially licensed a provincial course management system, did a survey of all of the content that had existed at the time 
and essentially combined it all into a, a central repository, for lack of a better word, so that all of the content, um, so all the districts essentially could take advantage of the content that uh, was available to them. So any district-based program now, and, and there are dozens of them throughout the province, uh, essentially can use the provincial course management system and the course content provided in there free of charge. Um, for their own purposes and then if they want to use their additional capacity, so if they've got extra spaces in an online course, they can essentially allow another district to take advantage of those for a small fee. I think that it was around $600 um, the last time I, I, I checked. I think it's a little bit more now. Um, there is also some cooperation that you see happening between boards. The Ontario eLearning Consortium uh, is a group of, I think it's 16 or 18 boards now. And one of the things that they do is they waive the fees um, between each other because they figure that in the end uh, it'll be a wash anyway. Um, there's a new organization that started this year, the Ontario Catholic eLearning Consortium, uh, which is set up very similar to the Ontario eLearning Consortium, although they don't waive the fees. And if you look at those two groups, you're looking at about a 1,000 students being served. Um, the French boards also have a consortium that they've put together um, to share resources when it comes to distance education. And they're serving about 1,300 students right now. And there are three private schools that exist in Ontario, uh, Virtual High School Ontario, the Ottawa Carleton E-School in Kiway, Tinek Internet High School. Um, and of those three, I believe the, the virtual high school, um, Ontario, is by far the, the largest. Uh, Kiwetanik is an interesting one because it's one that's focused specifically up on Aboriginal youth in northern Ontario, uh, primarily in these flying communities. And in the report itself, uh, we actually have a, a five-page, I think it's about five, four or five-page brief issue paper specifically focused upon that program. Uh, looking at Manitoba, the province is responsible for uh, the delivery of the program there. Um, so you see they have three different types of programs. They have a correspondence program, a teleconference system, and then they also have a web-based program that where they provide the content, but the districts actually manage their own, um, their own, um, uh, their own district-based programs. And when you look at the numbers there, they, they work it roughly evenly between the two programs that the ministry is looking at and the uh, one program that, that, that the districts are working with. Um, and the amount in terms of, of where it's happening throughout the province uh, appears to be quite extensive. Uh, it seems that just about every single district is participating in that web-based option to some extent. So those 4,000 students are spread out throughout the province. Um, looking at Saskatchewan, um, and actually I know that Howard is in the uh, the audience here now, and Howard is one of the ministry folks that uh, provided information about Manitoba. So if you think I've left it in critical, Howard, feel free to add it in the text box there. Um, looking at Saskatchewan, uh, two years ago, or maybe it was three now, I think it was two though, the province devolved the responsibility for distance education to the districts. Uh, they provided uh, some financial support to the districts um, so that um, um, they could essentially either build their own capacity or come up with some kind of plan to for the provision of distance education. Some of the districts essentially took that money and banked it and decided that they would use it to uh, essentially buy slots from other district-based programs. Um, some districts built their own capacity. Some districts had actually already been well on their way um, in terms of, of creating capacity. Um, 16 of those districts have actually come together and formed what they call the Saskatchewan Distance Learning Course Repository, which isn't necessarily an organization so much as it's kind of like an online database where districts can advertise, you know, here are the courses we are offering so that they are able to fill up their, their, sorry, their courses um, 
with the spaces that they don't normally have used. So if they only need 16 for their own internal capacity and the class can take 25, they've got nine spots that they could fill through this um, repository. Um, throughout the province, if you look at it, the number of students actually involved is about half of what you see in Manitoba uh, at about 3,500. Looking at Alberta, Alberta is, is, is an interesting case only because um, it's changed so much in recent history. Um, Alberta, like Ontario, and for that matter British Columbia, were some of the early adopters of this starting around 94-95. Uh, right now there is numerous district base, uh, there are several private programs, there's also a province-wide program in the Alberta Distance Learning Centre which um, as you'll see later, provides uh, opportunities not just in Alberta but in the north as well. Um, interestingly, there is no um, specific policies to deal with distributed learning in the province. In fact, if you go and look at the uh, K-12 handbook, there is a paragraph there that lists off about 12 or 13 different things that a school would need to consider if they are getting involved in online learning. But they don't provide, the ministry doesn't provide any guidance on how to do this. Um, they just say, you know, you need to think about things like seat time and enrollment and what constitutes, you know, attendance and these types of things. Um, and the changes have actually come about um, because they had, Alberta, three years ago, had started on this distributed learning strategy policy uh, where they were creating this framework. They had gone through um, several um, meetings throughout the province with stakeholders to try to get um, a distributed learning policy in place. And then the individual who was largely leading that in the Ministry of Education moved on and that seemed to stall. And for a while, no one really knew what was going on. And then these inspiring documents came in. I think the first one was inspiring education, and then the second one was inspiring action on education. And what's interesting with these inspiring documents is if you read through it, they don't specifically talk about distance education or distributed learning or anything like that. The way in which they describe the use and provision of online learning or online resources is in a very blended sense. Um, the way in which they sort of envision education five or ten years from now based upon this inspiring action and education document is a system where you could have students that are doing some courses online, you could have some students that are doing um, that are doing portions of a course online and portions of a course in the classroom. You could have students that are in the classroom that are using online resources sources that the line or the distinction between distance education and classroom education would essentially become erased and that um, you know it, it would just basically be education and you would use whatever resources or delivery methods were deemed the best um, for that particular um, you know teacher or student or or that particular course area or topic or what have you um, and, and that's actually a fascinating idea um, when you, you look at it, um, this idea of, of moving beyond this, this separateness um, to have a, a really inclusive online learning model, similar to what you see happening in about a third of those enrollments that I mentioned back in New Brunswick. Um, regardless, if you look at the number of students that are involved in distributed learning right now, it ranges in the, as best I can count when I start adding up all of the individual programs because uh, the ministry doesn't keep a central number, somewhere between 35,000 and 40,000. Um, and um, again, that that is a, an estimated range um, because there are no hard numbers. Looking at British Columbia, the uh, first online learning programs, and for that matter, the first correspondence education programs in, at the K-12 level, um, both of them happened in, in British Columbia. At present, there are 53 public and 12 private programs, um, mostly at the district level. There is some, um, the Open School of BC is, is still in operation and they still have a province-wide scope um, as well. 
one of the interesting things about uh, the British Columbia situation is that the funding follows the student. So you could have a student, say in Vancouver, that's taking a um, that's taking a course from the Northern British Columbia uh, Distance Education School, and then another course that they're taking from, um, you know, an online program up in the Kootenays, and then a couple of courses from their their own home school in in downtown Vancouver. Um, one of the things that is is interesting about the BC situation, other than the fact that when it comes to K-12 distance education, they are by far the most extensive users of it, um, is that they are also the most extensively regulated uh, province throughout the country. Um, one of the things that, that they've done, and I think I saw Tim, uh, he's listed as a way, but I think Tim Winkleman is, uh, is on the uh, session here. and um, He's with the Ministry of Education and has been the, the individual there for at least as long as I've been looking at it. And um, they do have a, what I would consider a very progressive um, regulatory policy there um, and I think because they've been able to um, essentially get all of their policy house in order it has actually helped the growth of distributed learning or distance education in that province. Looking at the Canadian North and we'll go west to east on this, in the Yukon uh, they have several programs um, they've got a video conferencing program internally that um, the, that has been growing over the past couple of years and in talking with the ministry folks there, um, they seem very excited by it and, and, and listening to what they're doing there. I'm actually quite excited by it as well. They also use programs from British Columbia and Alberta. I know they have a number of students enrolled in the Northern BC Distance Ed School. Most of their French immersion program comes from the ADLC. Um, and um, most of the actual regulation that they have for distance education is um, largely through these interprovincial agreements between the, the Ministry of Education in, in British Columbia and the individual programs in which they uh, to get their students from. Looking at the Northwest Territories, for the most part they use programs from Alberta, um, the ADLC I think being the largest one. Um, they're in the process of starting to create their own capacity there. Uh, they've actually had a, a number of, of um, individuals in the position that has been responsible for distance education at the, the departmental level there in the past three years. Um, so I think that may have uh, stalled some of their, their efforts there. Um, right now they've got about less than 200 students that are involved in there, which is about twice the number that you see in the Yukon, which um, makes a bit of sense because they also have about twice the K-12 students. Um, Nunavut is uh, similar to the Northwest Territories. Uh, they utilize a number of programs from Alberta and again the ADLC is probably the largest. Um, they've been in the process of trying to build internal capacity, have had a number of pilot projects that they've uh, undertaken over the last five to eight years, um, none of which they've, they've turned into any sort of larger um, initiative and um, while the uh, individuals in the department there are generally forthcoming with initial information. Uh, when you try to follow up with them, uh, there's not a lot of, of additional details that I've been able to get out of them and unfortunately the, the website for uh, their ministry is uh, severely lacking in terms of um, documents that may be of help there. In terms of looking at, across the country and, and um, I guess some takeaways from this, uh, a couple of things that, that I see in terms of uh, the Canadian context and, and how we're unique. Um, first is that for the most part distance education at the K-12 level is still seen as, as a substitute for face-to-face -face learning. Um, so you still see it at uh, happening primarily in rural areas. Um, you don't see it happening in urban areas as much um, in terms of a percentage, and particularly when we compare it to um, you know our, our colleagues south of the border. Uh, the other thing that um, you see in Canada that is very different than the United States is for the most part, unions tend to be supportive of online learning. 
um, at the K-12 level. I say cautious support because most of them do have some concerns about workload and quality of life issues so that uh, distance ed, um, you know, their, their membership that are involved in distance education aren't um, overly burdened and compared to those that are working in the face-to-face -face environment. But when you look at their policies, uh, you know, the, the collective agreement in Nova Scotia is one example. I know the largest union in Ontario at their last um, um, meeting or the last to last meeting um, actually had a motion that was passed that strongly supported online learning use in the province. Uh, if you look at British Columbia, the BC Teachers Federation have been among the um, most prolific group in terms of doing research on what is happening in BC at the, the, the school level, um, probably because they're trying to get a better understanding of what's going on to ensure that you know some of these workload issues are, are comparable. Um, but when you look across the country, there isn't a lot of systematic empirical research being done at K-12 online learning. So when you see a, a union like the BC Teachers Federation that are, are stepping up and, and actually looking at these things and um, you know making that information public as well, I think is um, is nice. The other thing that you don't see in Canada that you do see in other jurisdictions is that for the most part online learning hasn't become a political issue. Um, in the United States, unfortunately, online learning has gotten rolled in to the conservative school choice um, de-schooling agenda. And I mean, there was just a, the Digital Learning Council earlier today in the U.S. Uh, released their latest um, political, sorry, policy document. Um, related to online learning and that's something that you haven't seen in turn in in Canada to, for the most part I mean there has been um, obviously some disagreements uh, between different uh, political groups and obviously the the unions are, are one of, uh, of those um, but not in the the same sort of decisive and I would say destructive way that we see south of the border um, so this particular report is available at that URL, uh, the top one there, so the one that's INACL Canada Study 10 Final Web PDF. Although you can go to the bookstore, um, or for that matter, just go to INACL.org and click on research and you'd find all of them there. Um, but the bookstore contains the latest one as well as the previous two. So any questions or comments from the group? Go ahead, John. Just uh, click on the microphone to speak. Thank you. It's John Goldsmith here from Chilliwack. Um, we're seeing so what I would call two sort of separate models. You have the provincial model where there's sort of one program like New Brunswick. And then we've seen um, others where it's primarily a district responsibility. Just as your own opinion, do you have any thoughts on the strengths and weaknesses of each program? Like which one do you see as being scalable? Which one do you see as being able to continue forward in the future? I'd say depending on the jurisdiction, both are, are, are decent models. Um, you know, if you look at the ones that had strong um, and strong pro province-wide programs where really they were the only show in town, they tended to be small provinces. Um, you know, in Newfoundland and in and, and, and New Brunswick, we were talking about less than 2,000 students in Newfoundland. We were talking about, at their height, about 2,500 students in, in um, New Brunswick. If you look at Nova Scotia again, where they have uh, a strong province-based program and and then a couple of smaller district programs, actually two smaller district programs, that essentially use the the, uh, the province-wide system. Um, you're, again, you're looking at 2,500 um, enrollments, whereas if you look at BC, um, you know, I imagine the uh, I see Cindy from the Vancouver Learning Network online. I'm going to guess that you probably have more than 2,500, 3,000 enrollments just in that one program. Um, so if, if you, I think the the economy of scale dictates some of that because those strong province-wide ones um, 
tend to only be as big as some of the district-based ones you see in, in Alberta and Ontario and BC. Um, the one that I think is probably stands out to me would be the ADLC, because by far they are the largest group within Alberta. Um, and I know they're based out of, of a specific district. Pembicton, I think, is uh, the name of it, although I may have pronounced that wrong. Um, but they they are the one that has a province wide scope, and I see Ralph, who is the head of the um, uh, the ADLC, is online, so he may have some some thoughts as to how the ADLC has been able to be so successful in a province where you've got a lot of district based activity. Um, but when I I think when you try to compare those provinces that have province wide pro strong province wide programs, I think it's largely in part because they're only as big as some of the districts that you would have at West. Go ahead, Ralph, just grab the mic. Address uh, some of your points about why the Alberta Distance Learning Center is successful. The other thing that needs to be noted here is even though it's not public and you're not going to find it anywhere. A lot of the other programs that are listed by you are also supported by the Alberta Distance Learning Center as well. So we are what we call a service provider in the background to those districts as well. And the reason it is successful, and I believe most of these uh, programs are successful, is the funding that supports it. At the Alberta Distance Learning Center, we receive a separate envelope of funding for all students that are enrolled with us. Now, that's not to the detriment of the districts that also are responsible for these students. They still receive the full funding for their students. And uh, that actually has taken, uh, I guess, the place of what we call the sparsity and distance grant that jurisdictions used to receive in this province to educate students in sparsely populated areas. And so I would say that the success of the program, for one, it's the history of the Alberta District Learning Center. It used to be a branch of the uh, Education Ministry uh, and uh, was uh, divested in 1997 to the local school district in Barhead, Alberta, which is the Pembina Hills Regional Division. So uh, just uh, a few points as to why I believe it is successful and continues to be successful. Thank you, Ralph. I see Richard has uh, asked a question in the um, chat box about provincial success rates. Um, I can't speak for all of the provinces. I know I've looked extensively at the performance uh, rates in Newfoundland compared to uh, between face-to-face -face and the online students. And uh, one of the things that I found typically is that the online students do as well or better than uh, the face to well, usually as well as the face to face students. Uh, having said that, because these tend to be uh, largely uh, smaller rural schools, there tends to be a significant level of gatekeeping happening at the local level. So I'd suggest that we aren't comparing apples and oranges. Um, when we, we do those comparisons, and that's actually an argument I make when you look at um, comparing performance in, in between online and face-to-face and -face students in most jurisdictions. Uh, the U.S. are, are a good um, example of that. Um, you see a lot of the U.S. studies will come out. The U.S. DOE uh, Department of Education had one uh, by Barbara Means and her colleagues a little while ago that looked at um, that looked at a meta-analysis of these types of studies. Uh, one of the things that they don't factor in is that in some cases a successful completion essentially is defined as staying in the course until the end of the course. It's not grade dependent. Uh, so if you stayed in the course for the 10 months the course was being offered but you scored a 30, that's still a successful completion for some online programs. The other thing is a lot of online programs in the U.S., um, not to the same extent in Canada, but they have what they call trial periods where a student can be enrolled in the course. Um, usually they tend to be two to four weeks, about 60% of them, that's the, the numbers they use. Although some, and, and Randy's given an example there where uh, they don't start counting the students till halfway. There was actually one private program that we looked at, a, um, a doc student of mine at BYU and I did a study on this. There was one program that as long as the student had dropped before final exams, they were not considered ever being enrolled in the student or in in the course. Um, you know, so depending on when you start them as being officially enrolled, um, 
Bonnie, the Florida Virtual School has a four-week trial period. So any student that drops out in the first 28 days after they've originally enrolled is never considered to have been enrolled. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why students drop out. It's not necessarily considered a failure. Some of them go in, they look around at the course, decide it's not for them, and make a conscious uh, metacognitive decision that, you know, okay, I, I, I'm not going to learn this way. Um, the only actual numbers I've seen on that was a um, report from Florida Virtual in 1999-2000 at Big Bean McCarroll, where they indicated that um, their finding was that uh, Half of the students enrolled in Florida virtual courses that year got an A, and only 7% actually failed the course. But between 25 and 50% of the students, when you looked at individual courses, had dropped out during the trial period um, and weren't counted in the official enrollment. Um, so it's when you try to compare these face-to-face -face and um, online students in the K-12 environment, it's quite difficult to do. And I'd submit that it's a useless comparison because you're comparing apples and oranges. Michael, there was a, a great number of comments uh, scrolling through. There was a lot of people had uh, information to um, supplement what you were saying at the time. And uh, I'd like to invite some of those people to share those comments, because it was really hard to keep track of them as uh, they were going through the text box there. So feel free to grab the mic and share some of those comments and questions that were posted earlier. Um, just click on the mic, and then we'll give uh, Robert a turn after you. Hi, uh, my question is, um, about course development, so who develops courses or content for Ontario CMS? And um, could you comment on how course uh, content development takes place in different jurisdictions across the country? Is it the online teachers teaching the courses, or is it some um, development department in the, in the jurisdiction, or at the uh, board level or at the uh, provincial level? Tom, that in all honesty varies from province to province. Um, I know I can speak uh, to Newfoundland where um, they actually have a couple of multimedia people on staff and a couple of more on contract. Uh, what they do is they set out an RFP uh, where teachers uh, can propose to be the one to design the course and actually you, one of the things you submit is an outline as to how you would structure the online, excuse me, the online course. Um, and they select somebody, and it generally speaking is a, a an active teacher, generally a face-to-face -face teacher that uh, you know has some experience with technology. In a lot of cases, not necessarily one of their online teachers, and the person that develops the course won't necessarily teach that course. I know I've worked on the development of one and uh, the redevelopment of another with the CDLI, but I've never taught with them. Um, I know in the case of, of Ontario, they actually um, they will contract individuals to come in and do work with their um, with the courses that are in their course management system. In all honesty, I'll be honest with you, I don't know the demographic makeup of those people. If they're face-to-face -face teachers, if you know it's some web design company that they get. Um, my guess is is that looking at uh, most of the the programs out there, I'd say it's probably a combination of um, programs getting either individual teachers within their districts or within their online teaching staff, um, possibly being supplemented in some cases by multimedia people. Um, the only one that I know of that uh, really does it a little bit differently is actually Florida Virtual School, and that's largely due to their funding, where they um, they actually hire a team of individuals from instructional designers to multimedia specialists to face-to-face uh, -face teachers to actually university personnel that have an expertise in that area and have a, a committee from 
um, anywhere from you know a half a dozen to up to a dozen and a half people that are involved in the construction of one of their courses. They also tend to spend about $150,000 on each of the courses that they develop on average, whereas like I know the Illinois Virtual High School would spend about 10000 per course. Um, I know the contracts that they used to do in Newfoundland, and it's been about five, six years now, uh, they would tend to run 5000 for a course. Um, so, you know, it, it, it I imagine would vary quite widely across the country, although having some teacher within the program um, or having some kind of RFP would probably be the dominant model. And we've got a room here full of people that are in individual programs, so if they want to mention um, in the text box or grab the mic and indicate how their individual programs do, um, I'd welcome that. And I think, Robert, you had a question or comment as well? Hi, Robert. I'm very sorry. I had to grab the mic away from you because there was no sound at all. It was just a buzz. Uh, so perhaps you could type your question in the text box. Sorry, Robert. I had to steal the mic away from you again. There's nothing but buzz happening. So. Uh, uh, yeah, Randy, the audio setup wizard would be great, but I think at this point he's just got to uh, type his question in the text box. John, why don't you go ahead and uh, while uh, Robert's typing? Great, thank you. Um, just to sort of follow on question to uh, course content creation, I've heard via various studies that in the States, and I notice you've mentioned a couple of American models, that as much as 75% of the distance education content and delivery in the States is done by private for-profit or non-profit organizations. Uh, is that correct? And do you see that trend coming north of the border? I don't know if the specific number is correct. I can tell you that full-time online learning in the U.S., which basically means cyber charter schools, most of which are run by nonprofit or for-profit companies, um, do make up the largest growing segment of online learners at the K-12 level in the U.S. And um, right now, I think they actually, if you look at just sheer enrollments, they have about... Um, I think the 70% mark probably wouldn't be that far off. Um, one of the things that's allowed that to happen is the fact that the Americans have much more of a private sector business type model and all you have to do is look at the discussion going on now around educational reform in the U.S. where the ones that um, tend to get the, the most play are basically, you know, not educators, they're not people from the classroom, they're not educational experts, I mean, they're your Bill Gateses and, and, and your other business people that really, um, you know, are looking to essentially create an education system in the U.S. that is very equivalent to what their healthcare system looks like, um, in all honesty, a system where if you have economic or social capital, um, you will do quite well. If you have neither, then, you know, you're relegated to the trenches kind of thing. Um, and in that kind of political spectrum that you have, where um, education is just seen as, uh, you know, another commodity, another business item, um, that kind of bottom line thinking, it makes sense as to why these for-profit companies do so well south of the border. Um, you know, in our context, in all honesty, I don't see it happening, at least not for some time. And, and one of the uh, things that I notice about that is that um, if you look at a province like Alberta, Alberta is the only province right now in Canada that actually has legislation for charter schools. Um, which, you know, is, is one of the darlings of the conservative right in the U.S. as a way of circumventing public education. To the best of my knowledge, there's not a single online charter school 
that is operating in Alberta right now. Um, and, you know, if I was Connections Academy or K-12 Inc. or Insight Schools or um, Aventa or any of those other for-profit companies, um, to me, if it was politically palatable by the people, students, parents of Alberta, I would be in there in a second. Um, you know, but they haven't. And that may be in part ignorance on, on, on the fact that they have the ability to do this in Canada, but I don't think it is. I think that when they look at the political landscape that um, they realize that this isn't something that would be palatable to the typical Canadian because of the way in which we look at um, our public institutions like education. Um, so, I mean, I, I do see it happening a little bit on the electronic textbook front, and I, I think that's probably where you'll you'll see it happening more so um, as jurisdictions start to look. And I know the the Toronto District School Board has been having debates um, over the last six months about whether or not to look at um, online te the use of electronic textbooks and that's probably where you'll see the for-profit folks go but right now I mean that's where the for-profit folks are anyway in the regular textbook industry I don't think you'll see it in the provision of distance education the same way you see it um, south of the border um, I saw your question come through Robert about why eLearning Ontario hasn't participated um, or the ministry in Ontario part of it I think is because of the bureaucracy that happens there I, I've met with the folks at eLearning Ontario a couple of times um, and it's not out of a lack of interest um, but they have to go through certain channels within the ministry in order to get permission to be involved in external research and in most instances either because they've started that process too late or um, I, I mean I honestly don't know what the reasons are but they haven't been able to get permission from whoever it is above them on the bureaucratic um, uh, food chain, for lack of a better word, uh, to uh, allow them to participate. I don't think it's it's out of a lack of interest, and I don't think it's it's because they're somehow snubbing uh, the the report. Um, it has been largely because they haven't been given permission. And in all honesty, I, I believe that's the same in Alberta as well. Um, although, also you get a. Um, um, in Alberta, you've had a changeover and who's been responsible. And in some cases, um, actually, I was speaking with one individual um, last year who wasn't even, she thought he may have been the one responsible, but wasn't quite sure yet because different people had left and things were being reassigned in these things. So that also, I think, has is part of the issue as well. I'm going to grab the mic at this point, Michael, because we've uh, come to the end of the hour. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us again and uh, sharing your vast knowledge of uh, distance education offerings across Canada at the K-12 level. Uh, the information you can rattle off the top of your head just blows me away. <laughs> and from the States, you seem to have uh, be able to uh, answer all these questions without hesitation. It's, it's amazing. So thank you for uh, sharing that with us again this year. And I want to invite everybody to join us, uh, I guess, in the new year for our next cider session uh, with Wendy craglin Gauthier. She's going to be uh, joining us from the University of South Australia and speaking about uh, how to support teachers who are moving online from face-to-face uh, -face situations. So I know that uh, again, will we'll be very interesting and very pertinent for many of our participants. So I hope you can join us for that. And in the meantime, happy holidays to everybody, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next month.